Do you, uh, before I start, by show of hands, who knows about Data Kind UK? Who has volunteered for Data Kind UK? Okay, cool. There's plenty of opportunity, plenty of people um, that haven't heard about us yet. Uh, this is our agenda. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly. But um, Data Kind UK was founded in 2013, and the idea was that the same tools and skills and techniques and talent that the for profit sector uses to maximize profit could be used in the non profit sector as well. But there was a massive um, gap of skills, so Data Kind um, came in, and Data Kind UK, specifically in the UK, to, to close this gap. So the Account UK is a charity that helps other charities or other social organizations like go local governments uh, build data science capacity, essentially. Um, and this is all possible due to volunteers. There's very few members of uh, permanent staff uh, at Data Kind UK. It really, like most of the programs are, are, are developed by volunteers, uh, hopefully like yourselves. And with partner with about like 90 organizations. Some of them you can see there on the screen, like some, you know, some big names, um, or, you know, in SBCC, et cetera. And um, these are the sort of organizations that we work with, like, you know, mainly charities, but in general, like social organizations. And, and you know, the sizes of the organizations range from like very small charities um, to very big, uh, type of like national wide organizations. Uh, as I said, this is all possible due to volunteers. And here's a couple of pictures of some of the events. You can probably figure out which one happened after the pandemic. And, um, you know, like it's, it's really, it's really a volunteer-led organization. Like people like yourself, they come together for events like you know hackathons or, or, or long-term projects. And besides, you know, for helping the charities fulfill their missions uh, with uh, data science, it's just a nice vibe. It's just a nice group of like-minded people that come together and work, uh, you know, towards a, a common goal. Uh, so the the. We had some online events in 2020 and 2021, but the in-person events have resumed. So um, I'm gonna, at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna show you how to get involved and how to uh, join some of these events. Okay, quick overview, or, or maybe, you know, for some of, for many of you, uh, an overview, uh, an actual, um, you know, that I'm gonna tell what the account does. What, what do we do? Um, again, we help other charities build their data science capabilities. Um, it's essentially three, uh, three umbrellas. So the first one is building a data science community for the, for, um, for the non-profit sector. Second one is actually developing projects. Um, I'm going to show the, some of the examples. And the third one is providing like coaching and mentoring for organizations that do want to develop their uh, data science capabilities. So we have many programs. I'm going to focus on two of them today, which are the data dives and data calls. If you want to know about the other ones, I'm going to put the link on the, when I share the slides on the, on the Slack channel, I'm going to put the link uh, for the other ones. Uh, but just very briefly, uh, we have data support. You know, if a charity comes with a very specific question and they want to just understand something, you know, how do I collect this data properly? You, you know, you can, we can pair someone up. Uh, with them to help them understand uh, the you know that data data science needs, but the I suppose like the core projects are the the data dives and data calls. So data dives are sort of like the 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 main part of the data dives is a hackathon is a is a week long hackathon, but actually there's a build up to it where uh, three or four volunteers work together with a charity to understand. A specific problem to scope or to you know to precisely scope precisely scope a problem and clean their data to prepare for a weekend where we're going to bring together 20 20 20 20 ish volunteers they're going to uh, dive deep into um, some of the questions that the charities have and uh, data calls are slightly longer projects. So Adam ha has presented yesterday about one that we did with the Brilliant Club, you know, six months to one year. So this might be some, some piece of modeling that we do that runs into production that helps the charity, uh, you know, 
operationalize it and helps the charities. Um, so sort of like achieve, achieve something on an ongoing basis. And then there are a couple of other programs. So for those of you that do work on the charity sector, there is a social data society, which is a community of people, of data scientists, data analysts, data folks that get together and there is like regular, regular discussions and conversations and, and, and presentations. The idea for this one is that um, in the charity sector, there's, there's very often, you know, when there is a data team, it's just one person working there, so they don't have anyone to like bounce ideas off each other. So you come up with a social data society. Um, and we also develop things like the responsible data use playbook um, and, and so on. And over the years, so it's, it's, it's DataKind's 10th anniversary uh, this year, we partner, I showed a couple of charities where we partner with over 83 uh, charities, 100 projects, well over 2,000 volunteers. And if you do the mathematics to convert uh, volunteer hours to pound, you're going to see that we have provided over 3.8 million pounds in pro bono support. Um, and, um, and yeah, these are the numbers. Uh, people over here love numbers. And I, I've shown who we are, but I'd quite like to know who you are. So if, if this works, because, you know, live demo, you can go to menti.com, you can put that code, and um, we're going to be able to see something cool over here. Let me know if you can join. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the code is the it's up there. Um, it's a bit tiny now, but cool. Uh, you know, unsurprisingly, most people are data scientists. Whoever put other, if if you are comfortable with what what is your role? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, Cool, a uh, couple of uh, data engineers. Um, I'm gonna move on to the other one, which is like, which sector do you work on? Like, you know, FinTech, AdTech, or you know, just type whatever is more most appropriate. And then we're gonna see a, a word cloud. Got a lot of a word cloud. Um, yeah. Machine. So there's no, sometimes there's like one big, word, but this time it's sort of like quite heterogeneous. It's quite, uh, quite cool. Good. And then the third one is a trivia. And, and the idea for the trivia is that uh, to make sure that you're all going to be here at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to answer the question at the end of my presentation. <laughs> so the question is, oh, that's interesting. OK. Um, it did not work, uh, the, the trivia. Uh, but I'm going to ask the trivia anyway. I'm gonna, the, the question is, and you can sort of like keep it in the back of your head, how many charities do you think are registered in the UK? Is it, you, don't, you cannot Google. It's an easy, you know, you could Google and get it. <laughs> so how many charities do you think um, operate and are registered in the UK, in the charity registry? Cool. Um, yeah, it's good to see that people come from various different uh, backgrounds. Hopefully, now from now on, I'm going to show a couple of examples that will show that the you know the work that you're doing for your day job is actually transferable in the nonprofit sector. Like the same sort of problems, the same sort of abstract problems that you deal with uh, can be used in the in the nonprofit sector. Which is which is sort of like um, they the kind UK's um, ethos. So, what kind of problems do we usually uh, deal with? If if I were to categorize the problems into into a couple of buckets, I would say like the the most frequent one or one of the most frequent ones is understanding clients. Um, clients meaning like users of of, of a specific service. So, for example, like how many clients 
of my service um, are non-native English speakers, for example. I might be a charity that provides advice and I want to know how it's a percentage of our clients that doesn't speak English natively, so we can provide a more targeted support. Um, and, that, and that's a, you know, that's a sort of like quite fundamental and, and quite common descriptive analytical question that you probably all ask in your own organization, right? What percentage of our clients have a characteristic X or Y or Z? And, you know, same, same, same question here, slightly different purpose. Second bucket of questions is um, understanding need and demand. So just giving one very quick example, we work with a charity that deals with um, homeless people and they wanted to know, you know, what they are so the highest rates of rough, of rough sleeping, right? So you can, you know, you can think of that if you transfer that for the sort of for-profit questions that usually answer, you want, you want to map your demand and you want to map where you have the most so like prospective clients and prospective customers, same types of techniques, different purpose. Um, third bucket is um, evaluating services. Uh, you know, like it's it's relatively easy to evaluate services in the. For, I don't want to say easy, but it's more straightforward to evaluate services in the for-profit sector. If a service gave you more money, that's good. If it gave you less money, that's bad. But um, in the for-profit sector is slightly more nuanced. You know, the impact measures are less uh, well defined. But uh, nevertheless, we do, we do get a lot of questions about evaluating services. Say like, you know, I have a program A, I have a mentoring program. I want to know if my mentoring program actually helped people, um, you know, with their school performance. That's, that's, one of, that's one of the metrics that you might want to use. So, you know, given a metric to evaluate service, you can evaluate the service and, and improve operational efficiency, right? So there's, there's things that we do repetitively, there's things that we have to forecast for. Can we do this in a more automated way? So I'd say this, these are the, the things that most people do in the day jobs, whether they work in the for-profit or the non-profit sector. It's slightly different purpose. So now I'm going to go into the, I suppose, like my, my favorite examples. There's loads of examples. I'm going to put, put the links on, on Slack. But I'm um, just going to show some of the projects that we developed. And hopefully, um, you're going to have an idea of what, um, you know, what kind of techniques and what kind of projects we use. And I'm going to start with one, which is probably one of my favorites. It was a, a year ago, or maybe more than a year ago, with an organization called Citizens Advice Lucian. For those who are not in the UK, Citizens Advice is an organization that provides advice to people. It's a non-profit. Uh, they have presence in you know, various different areas of the UK, and they can provide advice about literally everything, like from you know, how do I get out of debt, or how do I get married, or you know, immigration issues, and stuff like that. And um, we worked with a couple of different branches of Citizens Advice, but this specific one is um, Citizens Advice Solution, which is a part of London, which happens to be where I live. And we, they wanted to understand whether they are providing advice for the people who need advice the most. That's the sort of over, overarching question that they wanted to understand. So this was a data dive, you know, six weeks of preparing data, framing the question, and then two days of like getting together with volunteers to answer that question. And um, essentially what, what, what the volunteers develop, you know, a couple of different pieces of analytics, but one of them was a map of the different sub-areas of, of this area called Lewisham, called local authorities, where um, what people, you know, using citizens advice data, where people ref are referred the most, where people access the service the most, but they were able to cross, to correlate that with something called the index of multiple deprivation with the areas which are more deprived. Now the question mathematically becomes, what is the correlation between the amount of advice that I give in different areas versus how deprived are the, these areas? And as you can see here, this is an overall map. It's, you know, quite well correlated. So the, the stuff on the left is the total number of cases um, you can think of the total number of people they gave advice to. Um, and and the, the, the stuff on the right is the index of, of deprivation, which is something that takes into account you know, 
housing, access to digital services and stuff. This is the overall map. And then the volunteers went on to drill down into specific issues like housing, etc. So are there any gaps that, that we can that we could fill? Are there any areas that we should be going and you know and targeting people more? And then they were able to you know identify specific sub areas which which they did. This is quite an interesting project. They presented that for the mayor of Lucian. Um, they were able to secure some funding, you know, to open some new services in some of the specific local authorities, which is quite quite impactful, and um, and just shows how um, how you can use these just these techniques for the um, for the nonprofit sector. You know, this involves like mapping. So this is a specific visualization tool that I did not know uh, during this data dive. It's called, does anyone know what this visualization tool is? No, it's called Kepler, Kepler.gl. You can just upload your data and then it builds a nice map like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's spatial uh, correlations and, and geo mapping and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, with a lot of statistics to back it up as well, like regret, you know, say, simple regressions, etc. So this is just a visualization of the outcome of the citizen's advice solution. Um, data dive. Um, the second one is an organization called Christians Against Poverty. Christians Against Poverty. This was a so quite a long ago, I'm going to go very quickly over this one. Christians Against Poverty help people get out of debt by you know, receiving people and matching them with debt coaches. And then debt coaches will recommend possible routes to get out of debt. Um, th these can be things like, you know, in the worst case scenario, you will have to default or you, know, you have other routes to sort of like get out of debt. And this is usually a quite cumbersome sort of like recommendation. And the question in this data dive is, can we use the features of the, of the clients and the referrals to have an idea of what is the best route, what is the route uh, for getting out of that, which is the most successful. Um, this is uh, it's just an indication of the types of uh, predictive models that, that we can build. The third, project um, is with a organization called Sobus. So Sobus is a community development organization that has a presence in a specific borough of London called Hammersmith of Fulham. And they work, well, they work to develop communities, you know, to strengthen communities, but in particular, they work with BAME communities in that area. And they wanted to understand what is the um, the needs for mental health in BAME communities in that area specifically. So they had a hypothesis, they had a sort of a hunch that it was, it was high, it was increasing, but they, they, they had never been able to actually back that up with data. So they got together with the, with the volunteers to essentially answer um, the questions whether you know, are, are BAME communities disproportionately represented um, in the mental health referral service or in the mental health provision service. Um, this is the map of the part, part of London and the, the amount of referrals um, of these communities. And you, and, and you can see, you know, by doing a lot of data wrangling, this is sort of like the output, but um, a lot of work has been put into it. Um, you can see, you know, the refer number of referrals for non-BAME community has been decreasing over time and for BAME community have been increasing over time, which is the sort of like confirms the hunch um, that they had. And then they went on to cross -correl to correlate that with the number of the amount of services it's provided in di different parts of the borough and find the gaps where, you know, there's a lot of need, but there's not much service kind of thing. Um, again, Similar questions if you abstract the use case away, similar questions to what you do um, in the, you know, in the, in the for-profit. And, um, and yeah, this is a quote from um, Shad, who is a very nice chap, uh, the head of uh, organizational development from uh, Sobos, saying that, you know, this data has opened doors. Next example is a uh, data course. So this was developed, if I'm not mistaken, four years ago, five years ago. 
uh, with an organization called the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center is a food bank. Um, you know, if you need, if if you are like if you have financial hardship, if you need food, you can get there. Um, they provide you um, uh, support, like food, toiletry, household uh, um, items, and, and that kind of stuff. And what the Welcome Center has observed is that over time, there, there are people that need like a, a sort of like point-wise support. There are people that something happened in their lives; they have to go there. They, they need some support, but there are people. Um, that are, it keeps coming back to the service, right, over and over and over. And this is usually an indication of some other underlying issue that, that could be addressed, that they could be referring them to, to another appropriate service. Like it could be an issue, it could be an indication of like debt that they could be referring to a debt coach, for example. So the question that the Welcome Center asked the data kind of volunteers was, can we use the features of the referrals or the features of the clients to, to predict whether there is a likelihood that a client will become dependent on the service? And become dependent means keep coming back over and over and over. So we could, refer, we could try and help them solve the underlying issue. Um, what the volunteers did was to build a machine learning model to, um, to, to predict just that. The most interesting thing, uh, they worked uh, on it for six, six months to one year, but the most interesting thing of this machine learning model is that it had to run, it had to run on a Windows server, which was from like 1997 or something like that. So this is the sort of constraints that you have sometimes when you work in the charity sector. <laughs> Um, and they did it, you know, like they, if I'm not mistaken, they deployed it on a AWS Lambda function and they made AWS Lambda talk to Windows 97. Who knows? <laughs> um, uh, and this is, this is actually implemented and, you know, you can see the workflow there, you know, a client comes and uh, volunteers puts the detail into the system and then uh, there is a model that scores and then you know, sends a notification to, to, to a case worker that is going to see whether that person is likely to become dependent and then that person can act. And this was um, you know, quite famous example, sort of like um, award-winning uh, project. But the most interesting thing, I suppose, is that you can do a sort of A-B testing over time. You can see if that actually helped um, decrease the number of people that becomes dependent. And, and there you can see the curve, like the trajectory that it was taking before implementing the system and the traje trajectory that started taking um, after implementing the system. Um, uh, which is quite interesting impact. There, there, there's a video, there's a report about this. I'm going to put the link on, on Slack. Cool. Uh, these are a couple of examples. There's many examples. If you're, if you're interested in more examples, you know, come talk to me. I'm sure Adam is happy to talk about it as well. Uh, different examples of how to use uh, data science in the nonprofit sector. But like after working with these like 80 plus charities, there's a couple of lessons which I think are universal and I thought it would be a good idea to, to share with you guys. And, and the first one, and um, I've introduced myself. I've, I was chapter leader for Data Kind UK for two years. I was a member of the scoping committee for four years, which is a committee that receives project applications, uh, so like reframes the projects, makes them data sciencible, and then um, sends it over to the volunteers. And I, I think like the one striking thing is that we get a lot of projects which are like, you know, we have this data set, do something with it those are not the best projects. The best projects are like, we have a problem, can we solve it? And then we try to see if the data set um, is, is helpful to solve the problem or not. So like, well, you know, like, I think like a well-framed problem, we can usually work with the subject matter experts to frame the problem in a way that's data sciencable. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that it's actionable. Like if I know X, like if I know that the most referrals comes from this part of the borough, what action can I take? You know, 
if I know X, I can do X, Y, and I can do Y and Z. That's one of the things that we used to think uh, when scoping these projects uh, all the time. Um, and then, and then you know, there are the rules of thumbs like specific, not prescriptive, uh, actionable. And, and some of the most interesting projects, especially for a hackathon, are like some that reflect a hunch. Like the charity has a hunch that this and that happens. Can we confirm or not? I'd say, I mean, not actual statistics, but I'd say half of the, the time we confirm, half of the time we don't. Um, but at least it, you know, it's something material that, that, that the charities have as a, had as a hunch that you can action on. So maybe they were operating based on an assumption that is not, not quite true. So they have to slightly tweak, uh, tweak their, their assumptions. Um, here's an example. This is a charity that uh, deals with like referrals. Um, I don't know if, if you're in the UK, you probably have come across the, the app. If you see some rough, rough sleeper, you can refer them through, through the app. Um, and then there are a couple of interventions that they can do. So, you know, we worked with them to figure out what are the, what are the factors that predict a, a positive outcome of referral, like an outcome that will um, we actually help that person and then to understand the demographics of people uh, referring to the system. A lot of the time that we spent scoping, we spent scoping projects were uh, not actually reframing the projects. We did also reframe the projects and the questions, but were, was thinking about ethics. I think uh, this is a good rule of thumb for whatever you're doing in terms of data science. You know, think about ethics, think about unintended consequences and, and risks. But um, when you work on the nonprofit sector, it's, 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 it's more important even. Because you, you're very often dealing with data, like sensitive data of very, very hard issues. You know, sometimes it's triggering even to open the data and see what the data is saying. So thinking about what are the unintended consequences is uh, quite uh, quite interesting, and and um, in terms of ethics or in terms of skills, um, this is the Venn diagram that describes usually how how you work. You know, you guys have the hacking skills or the math, um, statistics and knowledge skills, and and the the partners have the expertise, have the domain knowledge, um, and if you just do hacking with expertise, apparently there's this is danger zone. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess, you know, there's one lesson which is like, don't be flashy. Um, I would say, though, sometimes it is good to be a little bit flashy, you know, just to show what you can do with data science, just to tease people out with what are the possibilities. But uh, follow the constraints of the system that you are uh, delivering uh, on. Like, you know, try to understand what is the underlying systems that the stuff that you're going to develop is going to run on and what, um, how do people work in the charity? Are they going to be able to actually use what you're doing? If you're using a specific tool, if that's the proprietary, do they have the money to, to implement that, that, that solution? And um, just came back to the example of the Welcome Center where they had to implement the solution on, on a Windows server. And, and that's the constraint. And if that's the constraint, that's, that's the constraint. And finally, um, the, the way that we used to scope projects and the way that we used to help charities was to first understand where they are in terms of their maturity. Like, do they have a data science team? Do they have invested leadership? And then meet them where they are and the types of interventions that, that they need. So a lot of the time uh, when our chapter leader was spent like developing a framework or the framework was developed by implementing an interpretation of a framework called the data maturity framework to understand where charity partners are, uh, to have a conversation with them and then understand what are the, what are the best uh, solutions or, or the best interventions. So for this, we use the data maturity framework, which is something co-developed by DataKind UK. This is a five-level, seven-theme uh, framework where you can assess uh, 
it's particularly targeted at non-profit, but I think a lot of it is, is also transferable. Um, and you can assess whether, you know, where in the different themes, how, um, how advanced the, the charities are. So for instance, you know, like we, we would ask questions about like what kind of systems do you have? What kind of CRM systems do you have? Do you, do you have, what kind of skills do you have in-house? How invested the leadership is from, you know, the CEO is a data scientist to the CEO doesn't talk to anyone that does data kind of, kind of uh, level. And um, what kind of tools, what kind of uses? And that's very important because if you scope a question that, you know, will say develop a very advanced predictive analytics model um, and the charity is very low in their maturity, chances are that they're not going to use it. So, you know, you're going you're gonna to have, you have to meet the partner where, where they are in the data maturity. Um, so, yeah, you know, uses data analysis, leadership, cultural tools and skills. These are the things that, um, that we use to assess charities. An unaware charity is one that has very, very low score in that specific theme. And a mastering charity is someone that, um, you know, they have mastered that, that theme. And because we are sort of like data geeks, we're, we're actually able to collect over the two years as chapter lead data about what kind of organizations we work with in terms of data maturity. And as you can see, there's a broad range of, um, of types of data maturity. So these are, you know, anonymized different organizations that we worked with from um, developing to mastering organizations, which are usually the ones that go to do like a longer project, like a data call, to um, emerging organizations. Uh, this is of course biased data because these are the, the charities that Data Kind UK worked with. This is not a picture of the charities, the maturity of the sector itself, but um, it, gives, it gives an idea. But perhaps what, what was most in, in, interesting, and we wrote a report about that, was that 100% of the charities that we worked with score that lowest score in skills, which, which is a sort of like evidence for the skill gap um, in terms of data science in the, chari in the charity sector. And the highest scores were usually in things like tools. So usually the charities that come to data kind, they have a nice CRM system, they have a database, um, they just haven't made uh, full use of that. Cool. Um, get involved. I'm going to show a couple of ways that you can get involved. Uh, if, you, if you work for a charity, you can actually partner with us. If you are a data scientist, data engineer, data person, you can volunteer with us. And uh, if you work for a company that wants to host one of our event events, you can, also, you can also do that. And... Uh, with that, I think I'm going to leave you and I'm going to answer the question about how many charities are there in the UK. Does anyone want to give a guess? 10,000. 10,000. 20,000. Yeah, we're not limited to charities. Like, you know, if you have an organization which is a social organization, like local governments which are not registered charities, you can work with them as well. Um, so, you know, depending on the organization, we can also work with them. Well, let's do the, our auction, 20,000. 50,000. Half a million. Half a million. <laughs> you win the prize of, you know, highest bid. But <laughs> uh, no, so there are 100, uh, around 170,000 charities registered in the UK, which, um, you know, there's discussion about the government outsourcing the basic services to charities, but, you know, so, yeah. uh, but, that, but that means that, you know, there's loads of charities to partner with, um, and loads of charities to work with, uh, and, and you know, please do volunteer and please do get in touch.